So we only had uh, up until now just four lectures, and we actually started to do uh, actually three lectures, and we only started to do right set of things last night. And this month we'll pick it up, and most likely we'll have we should have at least covered two thirds of this course this week this month. So you will have lots and lots of uh, lectures on algorithms for big data this month. Okay, so. What did, what did we do last time? So consider the stream of uh, edges, okay? So now imagine that you have E1, E2, dot, 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 EM. This is your stream of edges. So we are only talking about, so this defines a graph on say V, which is like, which will denote by one to N, and edges E1, E2, EM. Right? So we are only talking about insertions of edges. There could also be deletion of edges, but for now, let's just focus ourselves on insertion of edges. And let's see, uh, okay, insertion of edges. And at any stage, what do we would like to do? Okay? So, and why are we looking at this model? Because massive graphs, you cannot keep the whole graph in the space. So you can think of that, you, you might have stored uh, this graph over along, and you might be able to say, think of a RAM, I can just go ahead and look. So at any point of time, I only have small look ahead, which I can keep things. So, or rather, I have a look ahead and the data is just passing through, right? So in this model, there are several things people do. People study something called one pass, means you only have one pass over the whole data. There is also something called two P passes, and Things do differ what you can compute and what you cannot compute at that point of time, okay? So we will focus on what is called, so in a classical streaming algorithm, what is, what is our goal at any point of time, right? Suppose you have EI, based on that you store something, okay? You store some sketch of whatever you have seen up until now, whatever you have seen until now, okay, some sketch. And you would like to answer some questions about, would like to answer question about the current graph. Look, so you have seen say EI edges, so this graph, let's call it GI, right? You'd like to answer, would like to answer questions about the current graph, GI looking at sketch, Lo GI looking at sketch SI, okay? So up until now, and what is one main goal here is to minimize the amount of space the algorithm takes, okay? Objective, okay? objective to minimize the size of just SI, right? So we would like to minimize the space, right, the sketch text, okay? So this is the whole common goal into this. So what is semi, so in streaming model, so like the most stringent model is when the space allowed in, and we are only talking about graph, okay? So in this, you allow big O of log big O of one times like poly log in space, okay? But very few things you can do in this. So people introduce what is called semi-streaming model. Semi-streaming model where we allow n times log big O of one times n space, right? So this model doesn't make much sense uh, for graphs which are already very sparse, like planar graphs and this, right? So this is important for arbitrary graph. In the sense that you give me any graph, so it could be dense, as many as n square s is, but we are only going to store some n poly log n space object, and that from that object we are able to answer lots and lots of questions, right? So, but if we only have linear number of edges in a graph, then we will see that these things needs to change a lot, a, a bit to fix what we have and what we would like to do, okay? Okay. 
So in this model, so we saw a few examples last time, okay. What was the first model we saw? What was called connectivity, okay. And we ask ourselves, how do we maintain connectivity, right? So at any point of time, I would like to sketch SI, store SI by looking at which I can tell whether, so E1 to EI is coming, right? And again, it's insertion only, okay? Just insertion only. E1 to EI is coming. I would like to store something, want to store SI such that looking at SI, looking at SI, we can infer whether GI is connected or not. Okay, so this is our goal. Okay, looking at SI, we can infer whether GI is connected or not. Okay, now what did we do to do this? If you recall correctly, we maintained we maintained we maintained FI, which was nothing but spanning forest. So what operation did we do at any point of time? Right. If any edge arrived, if any edge arrived, right, if any edge arrived, okay, and edge was across two connected components, two connected component, we added E to Fi, okay. So this is what we maintain Fi. So at any point of time, we are maintaining a spanning forest of the connected component of. So maintaining spanning forest of G. Okay. So how many edges will be storing? We will be storing at most n minus 1 edges and total amount of space, right, it is going to take is order n log n bits of space, right. And if you, you can count the number of connected component of your graph by looking at this. It is the same as the connected component of G, okay. Connected components of GI is same as connected components of FI, okay. So then we looked at the extension of this to what I call K is connectivity. K is connectivity. So what did we do? Now, now what did we store? We stored, we meant, so now edges are coming, E1, E2, right? What did we do? When an edge EI arrived, okay? When an edge EI arrived, now rather than maintaining one forest, we were maintaining F1, F2, FK, K forest. And what did we do to EI? Okay, we said add EI between two connected components of the smallest indexed FI, uh, smallest index FJ, right? So now EI comes, I check whether this edge belongs to like edge is between two different connected components in F1. If yes, then we add to F1. If it is not, then we look the, ask the same question to FT. If it was not, then we moved on. So why did you not add an edge? Because that edge is going across two different, like it is part of some connected component or both endpoint of that edge is part of the same connected component in F1, F2, FK and that is the only reason you are not going to add this edge. Fine. Okay. So this is what we are going to do. So initially you keep them empty set and at any stage, like at any stage, you do this else, ignore EI. Yeah. Now how much space will we take, right? The amount of to take, take to, so what will the algorithm do? Now you wanted to check whether graph is K connected or not at this point of time, at any stage. So what I'll say, a graph is K connected, so I need to prove, say something, right? So because you are not going to see the, your graph GI and you have to say whether graph is K is connected or not by just looking at your sketch. 
So now looking at this query, at looking at your sketch, what you're going to say, I said, look, is F1 union F2, FK, K is connected, right? If this is K is connected, then I will say GI is K is connected. But it's not obvious that, look, you might have ignored lots of edges. Why do you believe that this is true? So what lemma proved, what did the, what lemma did we prove? We proved that G is K is connected if and only if, right? F1 union F2 union FK is K is connected. So we prove this lemma. And once you prove this correct, once you prove this lemma, everything fit into the place, right? So this, uh, this lemma tells us that at any point of time, if you really want to check whether graph is K is connected or not, you just look at this F1 to FK which you have stored, check whether that is K is connected or not. And if that is K is connected, you can reply to this, right? And if this is not K is connected, you can say no, and you will be correct because of this lemma. So this was, so what does this imply? We can test whether, uh, we can check K is connectivity in a space how much? order k n log n because we are storing k for us. Okay, so this is the second example which we saw last time. Okay. So then we then we introduce the notion of spanners. Okay, and what is in the spanners? Basically, an alpha spanner of a graph, an alpha spanner of a, an alpha spanner of graph G is a subgraph H. And what is the property of this? Such that for any pair of vertices u comma v in vg what did we show we showed that the distance right so this is what we defined last time right what was a spanner so Basically, we have, what is an alpha spanner of a graph G? Basically, it is a subgraph of your graph such that if the distance between, what is called? So if you look at the distance between pair of vertices U, V, in G, I mean it is, so in H, it is at least as long as this, but it is not, not too stretched in H2. It is upper mounted by the alpha. And what algorithm did we make? So the algorithm we made for this problem was very simple, right? We said that if two vertices, look at my, currently I'm storing something, right? H was some empty set. And we said that if I add an edge, if there is no shortcut in my current graph, right? So what did we add? We said for each edge u comma v, if I looked at, if distance between u comma v is more than alpha times dg u v, Okay, add u comma v to h, right? So I look at my current graph. If they are too stretched in my current graph, then I add them, then I make them adjacent, okay? And what did we analyze? We said, look, we proved the following thing and we said, hey, look at alpha equal to 2t minus 1, okay? So for alpha equal to 2t minus 1, we showed that the following theorem, there exist, like this algorithm produces, okay, ever algorithm produces H with n to the power 1 plus 1 over t edges, okay, edges produces this edges that is. 2t minus 1 spanner, 2t minus 1 spanner. Now, 
if it has edges order n to the power 1 plus 1 by 2, 1 by t, how much space it will take? Roughly, the space it is going to take is order n to the power uh, 1 plus 1 by t times some log n, let's, of space, okay? And why is this correct? This is correct because all we said to ourselves that look at the graph h which you have considered, right? The girth of this graph is quite high, okay? So the way the proof goes, you say look at the girth of h, this is at least something. What is the girth of this graph? Is at least t. In fact, is less than equal to uh, strictly more than 2t. Girth of this graph is strictly more than 2t. And how did we show this? We said that, that that's very simple. Suppose girth of the graph is less than or equal to 2t, look at the cycle, right? Look at the last edge which comes here, right? Look at this last edge, like among all the edges this comes here, right? Why did you not add this edge? Right? We have to show that the girth of this graph is at hmm? Hmm? Why did you forget this last edge? Yes. Yeah. So why will why will we not add this last edge? Because look, this is H. Look, look, look at this. This is H. Right, so all these edges are added. Look at the last edge of this, right? When we were considering this edge, there was a detour of size 2t minus 1, so I cannot add this edge. That's it. Okay. And then if you do some analysis of, then you did some analysis like a, you draw some tree and blah, 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 then you can show that the number of edges, the number of vertices that will be there in H is only this much because locally they are like trees, okay? So this is the last, this is the thing we did towards the end. And then we did what we call sparsifiers. Okay? And what were the sparsifiers? And we actually talked about cut sparsifiers. So we said that an alpha sparsifier of a graph G is weighted subgraph H such that for any cut S V minus S, what is the property? The property is, if you look at the cut in S, right, it is at least as much as cut in G, but it is not too much. It is alpha times S. So basically given a graph G, I can come up with a graph H and put some edges on the weight such that if you look at the corresponding cut, right, if you look at the corresponding, uh, corresponding cut into S and V minus S in my graph. So this is my G. Look at the edges here. So imagine that there are some weighted edges whose weight is said capital W. Then if I look at the corresponding S, so this is G, and if I look at the corresponding S and V minus S, and I look at the capacity of cuts, cut edges here, then it is at least this much, and it is at most alpha times capacity of GS. Right? So in H. So given a graph G, what is the, and this should be true about for every S subset of VG. Right? So for every cut, I'm preserving this cut with some, roughly some property. Okay? And then, they, then there was a theorem, but this is in a static setting. Okay? 
there is a theorem in the static setting okay there exists a non streaming non streaming algorithm a non streaming algorithm a that constructs one plus epsilon sparsifiers with uh, only big o of h h okay and this is by batson spellman what is the spelling of spellman spellman And what is the name? Siribas Tava. Siribas Tava. Okay. But notice this is a non streaming algorithm. Okay. And what we wanted to do, we actually using this algorithm as a black box. Okay. Using this as a black box. Using this as a black box. We constructed. 1 plus epsilon sparsifiers in streaming setting of size order n log n epsilon square okay i think it was And what was an idea of this algorithm? The idea of this algorithm was very was not too high profile, is that so the two lemmas which were so we would like to recursively construct this. We would like to recursively construct this. And the two lemma which we used was quite this. And second one was about transitivity. So imagine that you have a sparsifier, okay? So how do I say this? So here is uh, H and J is an sparsifier of H, okay? H is a sparsifier of G. Suppose this is alpha, this is alpha. Then we prove that J is an alpha. If then J is alpha square a sparsifier for G. Right? And that was very easy because what is the meaning of definition of this? If you notice, it basically says you fix a cut S. Right? If you fix a cut S, then this will tell you that cj of s is less than or equal to with respect to h right c h of s alpha times c h of s okay now this is a sparsifier of this so we know that c h of s is alpha times c g in s right so this is alpha times alpha times c g in s and c h of s in any way c g of s right so this implies this is alpha square c g of s so what does this tell us if i have a sparsifier if i have a graph and i have a sparsifier and i further sparsify this then this sparsified object is just loses slightly in its quality with respect to the original graph okay and that that means that we can compose these kind of sparsifiers and use it recursively okay and what is the first lemma first lemma says that if h1 is a sparsifier of g1 and h2 is a sparsifier of g2 then h1 union h2 is an alpha sparsifier of g1 h2 is a alpha sparsifier then h1 union h2 is an alpha sparsifier for g1 union g2 okay so this is and this is easy to show it's not very hard 
okay? okay. So what did we do to prove this? Uh, this recursive steps uh, is quite important. So what we did is like, fine, okay. So what we did is that we divided this m length stream of a z, right? E1, E2, dot, dot, dot is coming, right? So I will store some amount. If it becomes too much, I will sparsify and keep it. That was the whole idea, okay? So I divided this into z0, g1, dot, 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 gt, and I'll tell you what gt is. So t will be going to be, okay? Uh, you know, let's say, yes, okay? Where each, each stream is of length t, which is roughly order n epsilon square. So that I can apply this, right? If I have graph big enough, then I can apply this to sparsify this. This is the whole objective, right? So I think of this that here's my big streams. Dot dot. So what do I do first? I sparsify this object. I sparsify this object. Now I apply lemma one and take the union of these two. Okay. What is the property? This is a sparsifier of the union. Right? But now it might contain more edges. So what should I apply? Now I apply lemma 2 and I specify this. Right? So if this was alpha sparsifier, this is alpha sparsifier, this is alpha sparsifier, alpha sp union only gave me an alpha sparsifier. But when I do this, I have lost on alpha square. So, so this is what you keep doing it. Okay? So basically if you notice that it's like a binary tree. where at the end, you have these little, little pieces here, right? At any point of time, you are in some one particular branch, right? And wherever the branch you are, you are keeping that kind of things, okay? Now, what does this imply? That at any point of time, how much things you are storing? You are just storing some, these kind of sparsifiers, and what is the depth of this tree? Depth of this tree will be log s, which is nothing but log m divided by n epsilon square. That is going to be the depth of this. Okay? Okay. But notice that I wanted a 1 plus epsilon sparsifier, right? But at every level, I lose an alpha. So, At the end, I'm actually, so if I fix some gamma, which we'll have to fix, we are going to get, suppose I'm applying with one plus gamma as sparsifier, then I'm going to get something like one plus gamma to the power log m sparsifier, right? The quality of sparsifier is going to be this. Whatever we are going to get is going to be this. So now I need to set gamma accordingly so that it takes care of all these kind of things, right? So I will set gamma equal to some epsilon times log m. If I, s this, because you wanted me to set, get epsilon log m, so I set this, then what will I get? I will get one plus epsilon sparsifier, if I set this. What is this? Epsilon times log m to the power log m. Hmm? So what is this? Now, hmm? So what will you get by this? You will get some 1 over E. 
right? So you will get one over e power epsilon. Why? It, this is exactly what you will get. Meaning? Some computation, who cares? What do you mean a log m term? Why will log m term be there? Why will there be a log m term? No. It is not 1, right? Yeah. Yeah, to the power x. What is this? It depends on what this is, right? So you will get roughly like 1 over u to the power epsilon, which is like uh, upper bound matrix thing, something. Okay. I, I've got the first, I have this. I got the second one, right? I have the second sparsifier. Now, what is a, I know that the union of these two things is a union of the sparsifier of these two things. Okay, so then I take this union and then I keep it small. What is, it is remaining a sparsifier, but it could have much more larger size. So I re sparsify it. Because imagine yourself if you, this, what is the size of this? I can only guarantee n over epsilon square. I can only guarantee n over epsilon square. So what is the size of these things? 2n over epsilon square. And I want to maintain invariant that I only have n over epsilon square object. So I reduce this. Each GI contains n over epsilon square edges. I'm only seeing edge stream, right? Right? So I see the first stream of and I have a counter which tells me which stream I which indexed object I am, right? And what like by looking like by I can keep an index which will tell me where I am in the stream. Right? And based on that I can keep objects. Like you do your post order transfer, so. Okay. So this is what we did till uh, last time. So what we will do today, uh, hopefully, is a slightly different thing, okay? So now we will move from this edge, is, edge insertion model to uh, slightly more general models and see how we can achieve those things. And okay, so imagine yourself that you are given you have you are. For now, I'm not going to worry about. I'm just going to have a communication question. So what is my communication question? So here are n people, n persons, n person, okay, uh, p1, player 1, player n. And each player has a vector of length n which tells us here whether i, j are friend or not, okay? Or think that or if you, if you like to think, think that you have a graph g and each of these guy contains a adjacency list of its own vertex, okay? So each, these are vertices and it keeps adjacency list or no, no, what do you call it? a row of an adjacency matrix, row of an adjacency matrix. Okay, so everybody is keeping this. Okay, now my goal is so there is nothing 
So everything is static. No two players can talk. Players can talk to each other. They have extreme computation power. Okay, space, time, they don't care. They would like to know, okay, want to know whether G is connected or not. Okay, and to do this, what they can do, so here is a third party, a central player. Okay, it gets information from all the players. Okay, okay, gets information from all the players. This is a center of player C. Gets information from each player, and based on that, it needs to decide whether G is connected or not. Okay, so that's my goal. Right? So what and what is what will be an easy solution to this problem? Right? What each player can do, just sense its list, right? Each player sends its list right, to C, right? And of course, now he has a whole of adjacency matrix. He can check whether the graph is connected or not by running any known uh, graph connectivity algorithm, okay? I do not care about how much time he takes or nothing, right? All I care about that if he has an information, he can do this, take this information and this. So the goal is, so of course, if each player sends n bits of information, n bits of information, total n square bit of information, connectivity is easy. Okay. What we would like to do is to reduce the amount of information we would like to send it to C. Right? Each player would like to send very few bits. Okay, each player would like to send as few bits as possible. Okay, so that's my goal. Apparently, it is not very, and just to see what algorithm needs to, what kind of situation algorithm needs to handle. Imagine that I have a bridge in my graph. This is a bridge, okay? Now, this player, U and V, this, look, if you look at the, from this player's perspective, he doesn't know whether this is, this, like, a edge in his list is a bridge or non-bridge because all he has is a local viewpoint. Same with V, right? Now, somehow they need to pass this information to the central player that look, this edge is more important than any other edge in its list, right? But if you think of this PIs, right? If you think of this PIs, I mean, he doesn't know. And look, you could have a huge degree here for all that I could. So the list of you could be very, very much, much larger than the list of V. And which one of this edge is important or critical for connectivity? I mean, neither you knows nor we knows, right? But so he needs to pass this information in a way that somehow the central player is able to understand this is an important player or this is an important edge. And somehow whatever we do, these important edges have been sent to the central player so that he can check whether the graph is connected or not based. Because imagine yourself, if you do not do send this edge, Right? No way this, no way the central player can achieve this. Okay. So what we are going to uh, see in today's lecture, not 
is that in fact each player is going to send some poly login information which is very counterintuitive each player is going to send poly login bits of information information it will be randomized okay so send a poly login bit of information such that so now the center player gets this poly login bits of information from each pi okay let's say s1 this is my stored information and based on that it can decide whether g is connected or not with high probability and what i mean by this if g is not connected p is replying with probability 1 that it is not connected but what can happen if g is connected p says connected with probability 1 minus 1 over n to the power c right so it could be that g is connected and my central player could say that this graph is not connected right but chance that it will happen is very low okay so this is the model we are going to work on okay so now i have to tell you that he has his list looking at his list he needs to send some information to this guy s1 which is not too much Similarly, each of these guys is going to apply some transformation, some algorithm, okay. So, what each player is going to do is each player PI is going to is going to apply some transformation we'll talk about what transformation it is and it is going to give some si now the way most of these algorithms work is that we actually decide determine decide what kind of algorithm we are going to implement prehand okay and i will tell you what i mean by this so in this paradigm of what I call, what this is exactly what is called sketching, okay, sketching, you decide two things. Here is your original object, okay, and you ask the third party, here is the third party, he needs to choose an algorithm. Say, for example, for connectivity, he needs to tell me what algorithm is he going to implement, okay. Now, what I'm going to do, so here I have list 1, L2, Ln, I'm going to give you list L1 tilde, L2 tilde, Ln tilde. So these are sketch space, okay. Now I'm going to run the same algorithm, but not with Li's, but with the sketch space, and I should be able to tell you whether the object is connected, not connected. So I need to do two things, one, how do I sketch? and b what kind of algorithm we are going to choose right which we are trying to implement over sketch space okay so there are two ingredients one a selection of an algorithm and b selection of how do we are going how are we going to sketch this object to the smaller space okay okay so any question here okay in yeah, I could give you a different sketch right because I, you will see wh why do I say this right because if you are going to implement some some different algorithm the algorithm will have a different set of steps and to implement those set of steps you might require different set of objects from me right so now I cannot I shouldn't be hoping to have some sort of universal sketching that applies to 
everything, right? Every algorithmic implementation of this, right? So in some sense, what I'm going to give you depends on what algorithm we are trying to implement over the linear, over the sketch space. Okay, is the idea clear? Okay. Which one? Here, no, it could be randomized for all that I care. But look, it imagine that uh, like it's a black box algorithm in some sense. It tells us, oh, from this list of this guy, do this. So uh, rather than doing at li, I will do at li tilde, and I will just return you that. Right. So this algorithm could very well be randomized. Right. But it also depends on again. You choose an algorithm. Where are the random choices are? I have to give you a sketch which will be able to simulate those random choices. Right? So that, that makes my point even more further. That if it is randomized, I like randomization is not from anywhere, right? It is randomization over something. Right? So somehow my I should be able to simulate that over something in the sketch which I produced to you. Okay. So the algorithm which we are going to, so there are lots of spanning tree algorithms, right? Ultimately, look at the first algorithm where we are maintaining connectivity. What were we maintaining? In the, just in the insertion only stream, what algorithm we were maintaining for connectivity? If this edge is not there, add. What this algorithm is? It's a Kruskal's algorithm, right? So for that connectivity, we were trying to implement Kruskal's algorithm. Maybe for here, we will implement some other spanning tree algorithm. Either we implement a known algorithm or we might have to make our own algorithm which we would like to maintain. Okay? So let's see if you have seen this algorithm before. I'm sure Venkatesh has seen it because he taught us. So, but let's see if you have seen this algorithm before. Okay? So what does algorithm does? So algorithm does the following. So this is non-streaming algorithm. Okay? This is not a streaming algorithm. This is what we would like to implement for connectivity in streaming stream. Non-streaming algorithm for connectivity. So what is my algorithm? For each node, select an edge arbitrarily. Select, for each node, select an edge incident to it arbitrarily. Arbitrarily. Okay. And secondly, for each connected component, select an edge incident to it. Okay. Select an ins edge incident to it again arbitrarily. And last thing, repeat above until process terminates. Okay. And when will process terminate? Tell me, when will it terminate? No, or you have got connected components. Like for each connected component, select like this fails means for any connected component at this point of time, I am not able to select any edge. So basically you have got a connected component. Edge incident to it, I said. Huh. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so the component select an edge incident to it, meaning an edge with one endpoint 
in the component and other outside, right. This is it. So if suppose this is my algorithm, let's forget about streaming, non-streaming algorithm. Why is it going to give us a spanning tree? Like, or whatever. If I apply this algorithm, at the end of this, why am I going to get a connected component? And how much round it will take? So first, let's do round complexity of this algorithm. Like, how many round this algorithm will work? It is important, at least the kind of things which we are going to do, it is important for us that we know how many round this algorithm will proceed. Like if you do distributed algorithm, this, this is the kind of algorithm which is implemented there in In the beginning, you have n nodes, right? Think of this as like a proposal algorithm, right? So everybody proposes to someone in this round, right? And so what is the size of components in the second round? Like what is this? What is the size of the components in the second round? Look, in the first round, first round, each connected component has size 2 power 0. What is the component in the second round? Like, this is the second round. What is the, what is the smallest size connected component you will get? Hmm? I claim it is 2 power 1, at least, because look at any guy. If he selects an edge, you get into, he might have selected someone else or might have selected himself. But whomever he has selected, right, whomever he has selected, so you are going to get some set of connected components. Here. Now what is the algorithm going to do? Each connected component is going to select an edge which is outside of it, right, with one incident. So third round. What will the size of the component? Look, look, at least this is 2, maybe other both are 2, but if you connect them together, it is at least 4, but maybe both are larger. So 2 power 2. So if you are at the ith round, what is the size of the component you have? Okay, this is minimum size of a connected component at ith round. Right? 2 power i minus 1. So at what stage will you stop? If i is like log n plus 1, you would have got all the n vertices. So number of rounds, this algorithm will go on is upper bounded by, in fact, let's write down log n plus 1. This is all. Because, so what is an invariant we are maintaining? Okay. Either a connected component remains connected component or double its size. Right? So at any round, either you stop growing or you double your sizes. Right? So basically, that is an invariant which we have been trying to maintain. And this is the reason why, after log n steps, this algorithm will terminate. So second, so this is one property. And what is the second property? Look at the set of the edges which we have selected in this process. My claim is the set of edges that we have selected contains a spanning forest. I'm not saying what you have, what you contain is a spanning forest. All I'm saying among the selected edges, you have what you have contains a spanning forest. For example, So here's the lemma. So what is my lemma? My lemma says, let f be the set of edges 
selected by the algorithm then f contains a spanning forest of input graph g and how many edges we would have selected in this process for example like this this could happen because you look at this triangle right in the beginning you chose him he chose him he chose him so you could get a cycle hmm at each round are, are we really like okay here how many edges you would have selected here how many edges you would have selected n second round every connected component has size at least 2 so you will not select more than n by 2 as many as components so if you do this so the number of edges which you will select we will select is at most 2n so f is bounded by 2 so now think of this this is a sketch of the spanning forest we have kept more than what we require but we have 2n edges kept and in this 2n edges i am guaranteed to contain a spanning forest do you see the proof of this lemma or do you want me to prove this that let f be the set of edges which has been selected here okay prove it for yourself this is not exercise okay so what we are going to do now is to implement this algorithm this this is called i think this is called uh, budovaka's algorithm i don't know how to pronounce this b o u budu b o r u and if i recall correctly it forms a backbone for most of the algorithm like any of the algorithms can i don't know okay so of the two objects i have told you which object i am going to implement okay just to understand this what are what do we need at any stage in this algorithm right let's try to abstract out what we need in this algorithm like what are we doing at any point of time okay so at any so let's if i abstract out the idea of this algorithm okay algorithm what kind of query what kind of query it is asking me the kind of query which is it asking me you are given a set of s some set of vertices and you ask is there an edge in s v minus s and if yes can you give me one right this is what this algorithm is based at any point of time i have set of vertices and the query is is there an edge in the cut s v minus s and if it is non empty can you give me one edge from this if somehow i know how to implement this nicely then i'm done with my algorithm because what will i do at any point of time i just run this algorithm first single vertex i say hey is the cut between me and every other vertex non empty if yes can you give me an can you give me an edge because this algorithm does not depend on what edge do i produce right all it depends on that give me some edge which is going out of me right so notice that connectivity process this algorithm actually has made a local process right oh 
take take an edge which is going out of me take it i do not care about anybody else right it's a local process but this local process is not on single like it runs in round at every round it's a local for some subset of nodes i don't care about anything else you, you really want to check connectivity hey take an edge from here and now what definition are we actually trying to use a graph g is connected if and only if for any subset if any partition of vertex n there is an edge going across right so the characterization which you are going to use and why this algorithm works of the because of this g is connected if and only if for all for all s subset of vg okay uh, cut s v minus s is non empty do you see the proof for this okay okay so imagine yourself so this is an idea which is which is the main reason why this algorithm is correct right so if so now if the graph is connected okay so forward direction if a graph is connected you take any cut look at s and look at v minus s what do you know what is the definition of graph is connected there is a vertex u here there is a vertex v here there is a path between u and v right there exist a path between u and v say p u v u is here v is here so if i trace this path how is it going to look like some point of time he has to cross this right and that edge is okay so what we know uh, e p u v intersection cut s minus v minus s is not equal to empty set okay so we have shown that if graph g is connected then look at any cut there is an edge now why other way around if between any cut there exists an edge why does it imply that the graph is connected there will be path between yeah but there are much simpler way of doing it okay you fix a vertex v and you use this in lots of approximation algorithm so let me tell you so you fix a vertex v there is a cut and now you will see why lots of connect s minus v i fix this cut it is non empty right pick an edge any arbitrary edge now you got so this is how you will make your spanning tree together remaining i have an edge right pick this vertex outside and that's it because for any cut this is so you can get a spanning tree out of this and this is exactly what we are trying to do but in parallel rather than fixing one vertex i say let's just do this right we might not get a spanning tree but we will get some spanning for like spanning set of edges this is it right so this is what we are trying to maintain so i could have maintained a span if i knew this i said hey hedge and edge everything else give me an arbitrary okay but if you look at your dice stress algorithm and this algorithm this is exactly what it does it grows your solution and it is based on the fact that the cut is non empty okay okay so this is what we would like to like in some sense the correctness of this algorithm depends on this and this is what we would like to somehow implement for us so to implement this algorithm i am going to introduce what is called sine vertex edge incidence graph okay and you will see why i am going to use this okay why am i going to use this you will see in a minute right is that you will see in a minute why why i am doing to do why what i am going to do now
So, suppose I had n vertex graph, right? I have an n vertex graph. I know this much because each p I knows that the number of it's no this list. It's an adjacency list. So here the list, okay, which is like i comma j. It is indexed by i comma j. Okay, here i comma j. I less than equal to j. So What is the size of this vector? Inches two. This one, it's a vertex edge incidence graph, right? So ideally, I would like to do is that if, so if they have a vertex V, okay, and I look at the edges which are incident to him, go and put one at those places and put zero other places, okay? Like the first approach will be, first approach will be is that I fix a vertex V, which is say number K. I'm not doing parameterized complexity, so K is free. Okay. And suppose K is incident to some I1, I2, IL, right? And I know this, right? Because I'm a vertex, I know this number, right? Imagine that the vertices are numbered from one to n. This is what I told. So I go and wherever this edge number comes, I just put one there and zero otherwise. Okay. So this is one possibility, right? So if you look at vertex edge incidence graph, how do you make a vertex edge incidence graph? You make a vertex edge incidence graph exactly precisely this, or look at the, no, or edge vertex incidence graph, right? So if this occurs here, so it is very different from that kind of incidence graph. It is more like a normal adjacency list, uh, sorry call, uh, adjacency matrix kind of graph, but I have not put vertices, but I have put edges itself. If you are incident to him, I just put one there. Okay. But clearly, if I look at a vertex and I go through this list, I know which edges he is incident to. Right? So rather than having this list, I will try to keep this list for every vertex. Now I will tell you why. But why we will be keeping this long list of size n choose 2. But at any point of time, remember, at any point of time, what is my goal? My goal is, if you look, look first round it is great for me, right? Because I look at this vertex and I tell you who he is adjacent to or not adjacent to by looking at his list. But Recursively, what I would like to maintain, if you notice here, this is what I'm trying to implement, that you give me a set of vertices, and I want to know whether there is an edge knowing or not, looking at this set of vertices, right? Or some modified version of this. Now the problem with this approach is, so basically, here is my S and here is my V minus S, okay? Somehow I look at, I want to look at these vectors and I would like to filter out, oh, there is an edge which is going across. Right? And imagine that you cannot see all these, because algorithm has performed some operation, right? What you would have keeping? You would have been probably thinking of this set S as one vertex. Right? He would like to think of this vertex as one vertex and just going through its list. So what I would like to do, if there is an edge here, like if there's an edge here, I would somehow like to cancel its, this thing. If I have an edge here, somehow I would like to cancel its contribution to this cut. But if I just do this, let's try to see what happens And I just imagine yourself adding this. 
So if I add 1, 1, there is 1 here because this edge is present here. If this 1, 1 is here, then, uh, then this edge is here. If I want to sum these guys, right? So clearly this 1, 1 is there, then this 2 will come here, right? So there is no way I am cancelling this guy. Like I only want to see edges which are incident to this. I mean, imagine that I have imagined that you yourself after this process you have moved to a new graph where what are vertices each connected com component represents a vertex each connected component represents a vertex and if there is an edge between two connected component I have an like I have an edge right. So imagine that I started with these vectors which are in the beginning but now I want to gradually or like very nicely get into this guy right but notice what is a pro what is what is the problem at this point of time? At this point of time, I do not see every edge of this graph. I might have kept some small spanning edges and so based on that I do not know what to decide, what not to decide. Okay. So this is why people introduce this idea of what is called signed vector. So now what we do is that we do not keep, we do not keep like this but th we think that there is an arbitrary fixed ordering on vertices, arbitrary but fixed ordering on vertices, okay. There is an arbitrary but fixed ordering on vertices, okay, like 1, 2, 3, n, okay. Now what I do, okay, so I still keep this vector but I say uh, i comma j okay is in e then i look at this i and look at this j if so this is an edge which has come if j is more than i then what i do okay let's let's do 1 2 3 4 5 like let's do one example to just I have edge 1, 2, I have edge 1, 3, I have edge 2, 3, so this is triangle, 3, 4 and 4, 5, okay. So this is an edge and I would like to make this graph. So if j is greater than or equal to i, then what do I put? Put 1. Else put minus 1. So now let's try to make a matrix for this. Okay. So how many vertices do I have? I have 5 vertex. So this graph will have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and what will be my edges? Let us write down the edges 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 2, 3, my God, 2, 4, 2, 5. Three comma four, three comma five, four comma five. So is one adjacent to which all edges? One two and one three. Right? But look, two is larger than one, three is larger than one. So what did I put here? One, one. And one is anyway not adjacent to everything else, so put 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Look at 2. 2 is also adjacent to 1. But what should I put here? Minus 1. Because because here is an edge. So think of this way that I if I am a guy, right? I go and give edges in a forward direction to all 
my higher up neighbors and give a minus 1 to all my lower neighbors. So this will become minus 1, right? Because 2 occurs as a second. Now there is no edge between uh, 1, 3, right? Or the, no, yeah, so this is 0, this is 0, this is 0, but what about 2, 3? It is 1, it is 1, right, because 2 is less than 3, zero. yeah, that is it. Now 3, there is no edge, okay, here again it is going to be minus 1 and is 3 adjacent to 4, yes it is, so 1 and 3 is, this is 0, here also minus 1 and then 0 everywhere. Huh? 3, 4, oh this is 1, 1, 4 is 0, yeah, sorry, my mistake. What about 4? Four? 4 has S to 3 and 5. So, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 1. And poor 5 only has S to 4, minus 1, okay. But what amazing thing happened? Look at any set S, okay. And look at any edge. So now look at S and look at the corresponding set of vectors. Okay, uh, let's call it. What what should I call this vector? Okay, some xi. Okay, so this is like xi. So suppose I have a vertex v1, v2, v3. V1, v2, v3. So consider x1, x2, and x3 the corresponding vectors. If there's an edge between v1 and v2, what is its contribution to the sum? xi, i going from 1 to 3, if I sum the corresponding vectors, what is its contribution? First of all, for any edge, I only have to look at the corresponding entry. This guy has exactly two ones, one corresponding to this vertex, one corresponding to this vertex. This is exactly like vertex edge incidence graph, right? This is why it's like, it's just that in vertex edge incidence graph, I write down only the edges which are present in my graph, but here I have written down all the edges. I mean, we could have actually written just the edges of my current graph and that would have, but just to maintain the, okay. Would. Now, what is the property of this? Summation xi, x1, x2, x3. Look at an edge. At least that edge is being counted. Suppose I had an edge between v1 and v3. v1 contributes to this edge how much? 1. v3 contributes to this how much? Minus 1. So, what is the contribution of this edge? 0. Look at an edge which is V minus S. Again, I do not know what it contributes to. So, what are the edges which actually contributes to the sum of S and V minus S? Is precisely those edges which are going to be here. And when I say contribute, if you look at the corresponding index, either it is 1 or minus 1, right? So, if I look at the support of the vector of the sum, right, then what do we achieve? In the support, uh, an index is non-zero if and only if there is an edge going from S to V minus S, okay. So, so here is our small little lemma which we proved. So, this is our encoding, so this is our encoding, okay. So, this is our encoding of our vector, here is the lemma. So the lemma says that non-zero entries of summation i in S xi corresponds to edges between S and V minus S. And proof is one line. And what is the proof? Jkth 
entry of summation okay jkth entry of i in s xi contributes non zero if and only if or equals zero if and only if j comma k is a subset of s If you are completely outside, if I look at those index, right, that is also 0, right, you are contributing nothing. So if you look at the non-zero entry, what is, what is its contribution? Its contribution is precisely those set of edges which are between S and B minus S. Okay. 